out there. There's some things that uh, you could uh, bring to help out, and they're listed there. If, if you want to participate in that, please sign up.
right, y'all go ahead and hold them up high. Good to see everybody here tonight. If you want to, go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. We'll get there in just a moment. I've got a couple of additions to my uh, corny preacher jokes that I want to try out on you and just see what you think. You've heard them before, and you're going to roll your eyes, and I'm sure you're going to think, wow, just wow. But I can't blame, you can't blame me for this. Ashland sent me these uh, earlier this week, and uh, anyway... Who's the shortest person in the Bible? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. I told you, you're going to go, oh man, oh man. Who's the best babysitter in the Bible? David. He rocked Goliath to sleep. Oh man, I know, that was awful. That was awful. I'm going to put that one at the bottom of the list. You need to build an ark? I know a guy. We'll move on. <laughs> Alrighty. If you got any better, let me know. I want to know. All right, John chapter number 14. We're going to examine the uh, uh, sixth uh, I am statement tonight. And uh, we... Uh, I'm, I'm certain as people drive by the church building and they see the sign out front from time to time, they have to wonder, what does that message mean? And I'm sure when people drive by and they see the WTL, John 14 and verse 6, they're probably trying to figure out while they're driving, what is WTL, what does that mean? And if you know what the verse in John 14 and verse 6 actually says, then, then maybe, maybe you can figure out that we're talking about the way, the truth, and the life. So they are paying attention to the sign out there. And I know you've had people in, in your uh, goings and comings have asked you, what does that sign mean? What is that all about? Just tell them to come and find out for themselves. But we're glad everybody is here, here tonight. And if you're on Facebook Live and you're streaming this service with us, we want you to know that we're honored by your presence as well. Hope and pray you can uh, come out and be with us in person uh, really, really soon. I'm going to find a spot that's not in the hurricane zone up there because it is it's blowing pretty strong up here. The word that took on flesh, uh, preparing to give himself as an offering for the sin uh, of the world. Uh, John's gospel begins in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the Word was God. Uh, verse 14 of that same chapter says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, it says. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You read down toward the end of the chapter there in John 1, verse 29. Uh, John sees Jesus in the distance coming His way, and he points Him out. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and so when we think about uh, the word uh, becoming flesh when we think about God becoming like us in human form that truly is a humbling thought to know that God cared enough to do something that we could not do for ourselves which would involve him uh, leaving heaven coming down to the earth which meant becoming like us and it was all for us, for lost humanity. Did we deserve anything that he has done for us? Nod your head like this, absolutely not. We do not deserve anything he's done for us. But aren't you glad he has done it anyway? Without uh, our merit or deserving anything. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 21, he says, for he made him, that is, God made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is sinlessly perfect in every way fathomable. Yet he became the sin sacrifice for us. He bore in his own body the sins of the entire world. The entire burden and debt that we owed, Jesus bore himself and paid it in full. 
And so when, when we think about this uh, I am statement in John chapter 14, it kind of is a, a transition. It, it, it gives us the instructions and it gives us direction and guidance that we need in life. We're going to explore that a little bit tonight. But the disciples that, that had been chosen and selected and, and told to come and follow Jesus, they had forsaken their past lives, laid down their, their, their very businesses and their occupations, walked away a lot of times from their families, and just completely and totally followed Jesus. And now they are about to face the grim reality uh, that, that their master, the one that they have literally left everything for, is, is talking about facing some kind of a brutal death on a cross. He's talking about dying and, and leaving and not going to be with them anymore. And so knowing their hearts, knowing their thoughts, and knowing what they were going through, Jesus, Jesus... He offered them words of encouragement, words of comfort. Not, not so much worried about what he was just about to be facing in his own death on the cross. He sees their confusion and, and knows uh, their, their doubt and can almost literally see the shock on their face when he tells them that he's going to die and that he's going to leave them. He's not going to be with them anymore. And he offers them these words of, of comfort and encouragement uh, in, in their time of distress. He's more concerned over them than he is really about his own self. And in John chapter 14, very familiar scripture, beginning in verse 1, uh, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And where I go you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, very familiar words. But tonight I want us to uh, examine uh, this amazing statement that Jesus makes. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The WTL. The way, the truth, and the life. And this statement as we get started, understand that it is both inclusive and exclusive at the very same time. We're just going to ask the very simple question, what is the way, the truth, and the life? What is that? What, what does Jesus mean? What is he saying when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life? And how is that going to be beneficial to us? If you remember some of the other I am statements Jesus has made, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door, the gate of the sheepfold. He also said, I am the good shepherd. And in John 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And now, and now thinking about all of those other I am statements leading up to this one. Number six in the list here in John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And before I forget, let me just share with you the last one that we're going to look at next week, Lord willing. The last one in John chapter 15 that Jesus gives, that great I am statement. I am the vine. I am the true vine. You are the branches. We're going to look at that uh, next week. But let's begin with the way. Jesus said, I am the way. What is the way that Jesus is speaking of? What's he talking about? 
Well, it's a path. It's a road. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey. And it is the only way or road or path that leads to the Father in heaven. There is only one way. Notice Jesus, and this is very basic, but we need to be reminded, Jesus did not say, I am a way. I'm not a way among many different ways. Jesus said, I am the way. And that quite literally means, I am the only way. The one and the only way. There is no other way, Jesus says. There is no other way to the Father but by and through me. I am the way. That's, that's inclusive. And that is obviously exclusive. Jesus includes only himself and excludes every other way possible. Last week I went to Florence. Not because I really wanted to, but I had to. Needed to. Take care of Taylor for a little while. And his car. Did you know that you can put in your iPhone, your smartphone, if you have maps, Google Maps or something, you can put in your current location and where you want to get to. And on this occasion, it gave me three alternative routes. It gave me a really long way, gave me a little bit shorter way, and it gave me the fastest route. I had three different options. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the way. There are no other ways. I am the one and the only way. And that's hard for us to, to really fathom. But Jesus includes only himself and excludes every other way possible. There is no other way. There is no other way. But man tries to, to make other ways possible. But remember who made this statement. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. And so this way that Jesus provides is a, a new and living way. In fact, it is a way that Jesus made in and of himself as he gave his life. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Jesus made this way possible in and of himself as he died, as he gave his life on Calvary. This way is exclusive because, again, it stands alone. It stands alone as the one true and only path to eternal life in the presence of the Father. So only in and through Jesus Christ can you and I obtain salvation. There is no other way. To help us really understand this, Scripture expounds. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, inclusive and exclusive. There's only one name. And that's the name of Jesus. Excludes every other possible way. But there is no other way, according to Scripture. Just one. Here's another one. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, he says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where? In Christ. Located in one person. Jesus. Can't be found anywhere else. Now, this is a scripture that you've got to work hard to misunderstand. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10, Paul said, "Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory." Where is salvation found? It's found in Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus said there are two options that you and I can go in life. There are two eternal directions that we could journey. Because guess what? You don't have to travel the, the one road that leads to heaven. He doesn't force us to, does he? He doesn't force us to. We can choose. Jesus described it in John, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Those two ways are either 
the, the straight and the narrow, the straight, difficult way. He says it very straight and difficult, and there's only a few that will find it. But where does that straight and narrow pathway lead? Jesus said, to eternal life. Then he talks about a wide, broad, easy road. He said there are going to be a lot of people that find that road. But where does that road end? Eternal destruction. Making my way to Florence, there comes a point when you're on a, on a two-lane road and all of a sudden as you get into the big city of Birmingham, you go from what feels like two or three lanes to about 12. I mean, it just, it just opens up and everybody is coming in every lane possible. It's just, it's scary. I mean, it's white knuckle time. And I've got my little old truck out there on about 85 miles an hour, and it's like I'm standing still, y'all. I mean, it is just insane. If you hit it at the right time, it's like you're the only one on the road. But if you hit it at the wrong time, guess what? The whole world is on I-65 going through Birmingham, it feels like. But that's the, that, that's the wide road, the broad road that leads to eternal destruction. And Jesus says there's only one way that you can go to get to the Father in heaven. And he said, I am that way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. Get that. Hear that. No one comes to the Father but by me. I'm the way. And he is the only way. So we have to ask ourselves tonight, am I on the way? Am I going in the way that leads to heaven? What about the truth? Jesus not only said, I am the way, a direction, a journey, a path that only leads to heaven, only to the Father, but he also said, I am the truth. I am the eternal spiritual information that you need. I am the truth. You know, Pilate would ask that very same question as he's got Jesus. And get this, Jesus is the truth in human form. Standing right in front of him, and how ironic is it that Pilate says, and what is truth? Don't you just want to interject in there somewhere? Duh, he's standing right here in front of you. But Pilate, Pilate would ask Jesus that very same question in John chapter 18, verse 38. And we're talking about truth, uh, that which is absolute does not change no matter what the world may say, no matter how you may feel or what you may think. The truth of God's Word is just that. It is the truth of God's Word, and it does not change. Whether you believe it or not, whether you obey it or not, guess what? The truth of God's Word remains the truth of God's Word. Jesus would very plainly say in John 8 and verse 32, He would say, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's not my truth. Not your truth, not the truth of the world, but this is God's truth, the Word of God. In the longest recorded prayer of Jesus, you know it in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for unity. And in verse number 17, in that prayer, Jesus prays, Sanctify them with your truth. Your Word is truth. The word sanctify means to set apart. What sets us apart from others, it's going to be our obedience and adherence to our attitude toward the truth of God's Word. It is God's holy Word. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in your Bible. 176 verses, we're not going to read them all. But there's one in particular uh, that stands out real good. 142. Psalm 119, verse 142 says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Time and time again, we get little nuggets like that in God's Word, letting us know the power of His own Word, that it is truth, that it doesn't rely on, on man to figure it out. Psalm 119, verse 160 this is a great one. If you're in the habit of marking something, this is a good verse to mark. 
Psalm 119 verse 160 says the, the entirety or the sum of your word is truth. How much of God's word is truth? 97 point, no, try that again. 99 point, no, 100 percent. It's all truth. And it is God's truth. He says, the entirety, the sum total of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Jesus Christ, the word who became flesh, he came to bear witness of that truth. We know that the law came by Moses. But in John chapter 1, verse number 17, both grace and truth came uh, by Jesus Christ. You see, without the truth of God's word, we wouldn't know the way. The truth of God's word is almost like a map in many ways. It gets us from where we are to where God wants us to be. See, God's truth is the absolute standard by which you and I are to, to live to love, uh, to, to serve, and, and, and to base our life on. If we want to go to heaven, Jesus is saying not only is he the way, but he is the source of, of the information that we need to get there. We've got to follow him and do what he says. After all, he is the only one who has been from heaven to earth and wants to take all of us with him. But we've got to follow him. We've got to go uh, with with him in the way but guess what when Jesus says I am the truth we also need to realize that this truth the the Word of God is the standard by which we're going to be judged in that final day John chapter 12 verse 48 we're going to be judged by the standard of God's holy word that means we're going to be placed in the balance and lined up with the Word of God and we're going to see where we are lacking. It's going to be the standard, the plumb line, if you will, of our lives. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. But he also said, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, I am the life. And we've touched on this a little bit. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, we go back into John chapter 10. He said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So we've touched a little bit on, on this, but we need to be uh, reminded again. We live in a confused society, don't we? God is the source. God is the, the origin and the giver of all life. Go back with me to the very beginning of your Bible, the book of beginnings, Genesis and let's look at the very first verse. This is one of those verses, well, that we already know. But it's, it's good to be reminded. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It all started with him. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. Again, familiar verses. In the creation account, verse 26 of Genesis 1, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. How many genders are there? God says there are two. What are they? Male and female. I read an article recently. It was in the, in the medical news today. An online article. It was a pretty lengthy article, but here, here's the gist of it. Scientists want us to believe that there are more than, or at least, 52 different genders. Hmm. Hmm. 52 different genders. We live in a confused world. 
But God says in his word, we just read it, that God created them male and female. And you don't have to be a scientist to figure it out. But let's read from Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, number 7, talking about the life and God being the source and, and, and the very origin and giver of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Let's go over to the New Testament, to Acts chapter uh, 17. I want you to listen to a powerful uh, sermon given here in Acts chapter 17. This is Paul and his sermon that if you wanted to give it a title would be the unknown God. The unknown God sermon that he gives here. Beginning in verse number 24 of Acts chapter 17. Listen to what he says. The end of verse number 23, he says, Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Verse number 29 says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of that divine nature as like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. God is the, God is the source of all of life. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not necessarily talking about physical life. He's more concerned about the spiritual, eternal life that only he can uh, provide. He came into this world to provide and make available to us the abundant life that he spoke of in John chapter 10. In fact, you go back to John chapter 6, he told his disciples that the words that he spoke to them, they are not only spirit, but they are life. And they would even tell him, where, where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's what he came for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Eternal, everlasting life. Romans 6, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is, it's okay, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he came for. We know sin destroys. The consequence and the penalty for sin is death. But Jesus came to give us life, abundant life in the here and now, eternal life in heaven. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus being tempted. He'd been fasting, no doubt. He was hungry in the flesh. Satan knew that and tempted him to, to turn those stones into bread and just to go ahead and satisfy his hunger. But Jesus, Jesus responded with the spiritual truth of God's word. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, uh, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, this life is found by faithfully following Jesus, who is the way. And the truth that only Jesus provides, and, and following in this way, and obeying the, the truth that he has given us, guess what it leads to? And results in abundant life, eternal life, that Jesus wants all of us to have. 
in our pew packers class at the very end, usually one of the last questions that Richard will, will ask is, what is true success in life? And all of our kids are, are gone, so they can't help you with this answer. What is true success in life? Not everybody at once. Richard knows, I'm sure. Obeying God and living faithfully. That's what true success is. Obeying God and living faithfully. By the way, what is true failure? A life without God. But that's not what God wants. God wants to us to have true success. And that means we must choose to obey God and live faithfully for Him. The only other alternative is to not obey Him and live for some other reason. And that is true failure, a life without God. So when, when we think about this I am statement, there's a lot more to it than really just meets the eye when, when you read through it. Jesus said, I am the way. Okay. I am the truth. All right. I'm the life. Well, okay. But it's that last part. That last part of John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If I were to ask you tonight to raise your hand if you want to go to heaven, I'm sure every hand is going to go up. You might even be bold enough to raise them both up. I want to go. We, we want to go to heaven, no doubt about it. But will we live the life that God requires for us to make heaven our home? You realize there's nothing more that God can do for us to make heaven our home. He's made the way possible. He's given us the instructions on how to do it. Now we've got to live it. We've got to put it into practice. We've got to choose to follow him. And aren't you glad God does not require sinless perfection? None of us could do it. That's why Jesus came. He was sinless. He was perfect. And that qualified him and him alone to be the perfect Lamb of God to die on the cross for the sins of the world. So tonight, are we walking, living in his way? Are, are we listening to his truth and putting it into practice? James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. You can sit and listen to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sermons, but guess what? None of them are going to do a lick of good until you put them into practice, right? In the old saying, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. That's true. I would. Let's put them into practice. Let's, let's put God's word into practice in our own lives. Listening to his truth. Obeying him. And, and living our lives for him. You see, without Jesus, there is no going. Without Jesus, there is no knowing. And without Jesus, there is no living. Because after all, again, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we want to go to heaven, we've got to go his way. Are you following him? See, we can't expect others to do what we're not already doing ourselves or willing to do ourselves. The ironic thing is, God doesn't force you to, does he? God says the choice really is yours. And you can do what you want to do. We see that proven at the cross. As horrible as it is, choices were made. Decisions were made. You and I make them all the time, every single day. The greatest decision you could ever make in this life is to obey God. To obey His plan of salvation. To put Christ on in baptism. To be raised to walk in newness of life as a child of God. To be added to His church and then to live faithfully to live faithfully that's probably the hardest part right there it's the hardest part is living faithfully but God has given us every tool and all the resources we need to do just that but he can't and he won't do it for us he wants us to make that choice and make that commitment to live for him as we surrender ourselves to him 
He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. But will you go with Him? Will you listen to Him and obey? And will you live for Him each and every day? So that one day when all of life is over, you and I can stand before Him with confidence and hear Him declare, Well done, good and faithful servant. We want to hear that. But we've got to live the life that God can say that over when it's over. If you're here tonight and subject to the invitation of God, if there's a way we can help you in any way, you're not coming to the church, you're not coming to me, you're coming to Christ. If we can help you, please come and let us know how as we stand together and sing.